Welcome everyone to ComCon Virtual 2020. Um, yeah, this is a little bit different for everyone. Um, but first up is Lorenzo Miniero from Italy, from the Me Echo team. Um, many of you will hopefully already know him from the Janus project. Um, and he's a dear friend of mine um, and they, they've been doing fantastic things through COVID um, with, with ITF and Lorenzo is going to talk to you about that. Hi, everybody, and thanks, Dan, for the introduction. So, yeah, my talk will try to address exactly these troubling times that we've lived in uh, from a specific perspective, the one related to live events and how they basically stopped uh, taking place for obvious reasons. And before starting, let me share some, some few words about me. So I got my PhD at the University of Naples a few years ago and with some colleagues there. I co-founded a company called Miteco. And uh, some may know me as the main author of the Janus uh, WebRTC server and open source WebRTC server implementation. And there you can find some links uh, that share some more information about my work, my hobbies, and these kind of things. And as pretty much everybody who is uh, watching this, uh, I've been working from home for, for a very long time, much more than I'm, that I was used to, actually. And luckily, I was stuck in a very nice place to do that. So with a major disadvantage though. So uh, I do live in Naples in, uh, in the south of Italy, which is famous all over the world for being the hometown of pizza. And of course, as soon as uh, uh, restaurants, delivery services, and, uh, and things like this stopped working, it basically meant that everybody started getting the, some infamous uh, pizza withdrawal. Basically, we started craving for it and we couldn't eat it and do anything with that, which meant that we basically had to take this matter into our own hands quite literally, because I basically had to learn how to how to make a pizza on my own if I really wanted to eat one. And I tried over and over and over again with, let's say, dubious results, as you can see. But again, it scratched that each. I learned something, so it was really nice, a nice experience after all. The problem is I didn't stop there. So I started uh, delving with uh, bakery as well. So you can see the ugliest banana bread you'll see today or probably ever. Uh, this uh, this jam tart as well, or the ugliest apple pie you'll see today, uh, in principle. So I mean, it was uh, it was a fun experience, that's for sure. But of course, what you are interested in hearing now is not my uh, cooking attempts, but really what was the impact of all these troubling times on business in general. And uh, basically, um, as you can imagine, as a small company, we do have several activities that we travel to try to cover, uh, in particular, especially related to WebRTC. And as you can imagine, let's say that consulting services, commercial support, and Janus licenses basically did see an increase in these times, mostly because, of course, everybody woke up and found out that they needed WebRTC one way or another uh, to keep on, on doing their business or to interact with their colleagues and something like this. So that was indeed a plus from a business perspective for us. What was actually quite impacted was the streaming of live events. And this is exactly what I'll try to, to cover more in this presentation and basically how we tried to, to pivot a bit into a different line of business to, to stay relevant in this context. So first of all, just to give you a quick context about how that worked, we basically provided this service for, for different events, mainly the ITF, where we are the, remote, the official tool for remote participation some ACM conferences, but a few other events too. So we, it was actually a growing business for us and typically involved some specific activities. So of course we had to fly some people there, bring some equipment with us. And then it was a matter of setting up all the equipment, like placing the camera somewhere, uh, high, splitting the signal from the projector so that we could get that feed as well as a video stream, hook up to the video mixer in the room so that we could interact uh, with it somehow, add some uh, customizations to the web page for the streaming event, this kind of thing. And then basically we would stream everything via WebRTC to allow WebRT, uh, remote participants to, to interact with the audience somehow. And of course, then the world changed. And basically there have been no live events in these past few months, which basically meant that this line of business that we had was of course just died, uh, just died. And just to give you a quick uh, introduction of how that, how that worked at the time, mostly because we still uh, tried to, to include some, uh, some ways of, of doing things that we did at the time also in our new approach, I'll, I'll try to share some information about how we did this for the ITF meetings in particular. And this is just because 
uh, that platform was probably the most advanced uh, streaming platform that we conceived for, for an event. And so it gives you a, a good idea of how we did things at the time. And so, for instance, I mentioned that we needed to interact with the mixer board. And this was, of course, quite important because the mixer is where all the uh, local microphones in, at the venue were hooked up to. So it could capture all the contributions by local attendees. And at the same time, a mixer is also what feeds the local speakers as well. And so by hooking up to these components, basically we had a laptop in the room that was connected to this mixer so that it could get the uh, audio from the local microphones, inject it into a SIP call through the Janus SIP plugin via WebRTC, and then have a remote mixer. In this case, it was based on Asterisk, basically mix everything. And then everything that was said by remote attendees would go back through the same uh, peer connection injected into the mixer board and played out loud through the speakers in the room. And thanks to the echo cancellation of both WebRTC and the mixer board itself and some careful tuning, it basically provided with a very good experience overall. For video, it was, uh, it was simpler and a bit different. So basically I mentioned how we would br bring our own controllable cameras, how we would have a splitter capture the, the feed from uh, from the projector and things like this. And basically we had, we captured both of the streams, encode them in real time to VP8 and then send them as plain RTP with the help of FFmpeg as a tool to Janus itself. And then Janus would turn that into a WebRTC broadcast itself. So uh, a very easy way to do that. And this slide is actually a bit outdated because we were not using a laptop for that, but we were just using basic Raspberry Pis, which uh, may sound weird, but actually a Raspberry Pi was powerful enough to encode both of the streams at the same time and stream them to Janus as well. And, and it made for a convenient way to, uh, to ship things and actually do the setup accordingly. And finally, of course, we did want to have remote participants be involved. And for that, we just relied plain simply on an SFU approach. So remote speakers could publish their video through the Janus video room, our SFU plugin, this would, of course, be sent to all the passive attendees who could just basically subscribe to this. But we also subscribed to the same stream using another laptop that we placed in each room, which was connected to a second screen as well. And the reason for that was simple. We, of course, wanted the attendees in the local audience in the physical rooms to also be able to watch the remote speakers at the same time. And this was a convenient way to get the video from the remote speakers and have them projected uh, somewhere else. And I, I couldn't find any specific uh, photos of the actual setup, but I did find this old tweet by Dr. Alex, where I basically gave him and Emily of by Jitsi a quick tour of how the whole setup worked. And uh, I remember them being quite happy about, about all that. And of course, I mean, this whole setup was quite, quite transparent to end users. So eventually it all ended up into an integrated application to have an integrated experience. So here you can see, for instance, slides, uh, the feed coming from the physical camera to FFmpeg and the remote attendee coming from WebRTC all showing up in the same web page with no real real difference. And the ability to have multiple streams at the same time meant that we could basically also play a bit with layouts, possibly focus, give more focus to the remote attendee, possibly hide the slides when they were not really relevant, show multiple remote speakers at the same time. And this picture instead shows you what I was saying before. So how we could basically take advantage of a second screen in the room to show a remote attendee, a remote presenter in the room itself to give them uh, more presence and make them feel more part of the conversation at the same time. And all of these streams, of course, no matter the source were recorded and then mixed in a post-processing phase into a single video file so that we could then publish them over YouTube as, a, as an asset, basically. And the ability to have different streams that could be handled in different ways also gave us the opportunity to work on a, a director room of sorts, because I actually forgot to say that, but ITF rooms, uh, there are typically eight sessions going on in parallel at any, at any meeting, and we are less than eight people. So having a director room like this gives us a very easy way of controlling the room, controlling the cameras, figure out if things were going wrong and things like this. But of course, we were also, I mean, this was the more advanced part, but there were also use cases where we didn't really need to do anything uh, more complex than that. So for instance, for most of the IACM conferences, we, we really didn't provide any uh, active remote participation. It was more closely related to a webinar instead. And so the setup was similar. We were still hooking up to the mixer. We were still hooking, placing cameras and splitting the signal screen, but we would just broadcast all this into a uh, to a web page via WebRTC and possibly integrate, for instance, a Twitter feed of the event on the side so that it could give a more contextual information, which incidentally was also the same approach we followed for our for streaming our own conference as well. 
So in this case, we also integrated the Twitter feed of the event, and we we basically streamed the whole, uh, the whole event that way. There wasn't, of course, not much that we could do for streaming remote pizza because, of course, WebRTC can do a lot of things, but it cannot do that. But again, as I was saying, uh, the world eventually changed, and basically, uh, one of the areas where this was impacted was indeed live events, which had an impact on events that were supposed to take place and had to basically change the way they were doing things. And in this picture, for instance, you can see the official announcement by which the ITF announced that uh, ITF 108 that was supposed to take place in Madrid would instead happen completely remotely. And uh, I mean, we are we are doing ComCon virtually as well, which is which is a bit of a pity because I really like the live feel of ComCon. I really liked the uh, the first two editions that then uh, brought up. But at the same time, I'm really happy that uh, some form of ComCon is still taking place. And uh, ClueCon is going, is going to be completely online as well in their ClueCon deconstructed approach. Uh, IPTCOM and IITRTC, which is also happening in Chicago, it's taking place in October, but they are also going to, do, to, to make a completely virtual event. And last but not least, I mean, I should probably update the website, but JanusCon, the second edition of JanusCon, will also be completely virtual in a, uh, in a few months. So, of course, we, we wanted to, to move from the plain uh, live events uh, streaming platform that we had to some, something that was completely virtual, which meant that we had to, uh, to address some, uh, some important challenges. And so, first of all, the, the first thing that one needs to take into account is that remote participants are not second-class citizens anymore. Because with regular live events, it was easy to just partly disregard remote attendees because mostly all the action was actually happening in the room. People were interacting there, the, the presentations were happening there, and so it was sometimes easy to forget about remote participants. In this case, you really can't because they are really the only ones there. So the remote participants play, of course, the, the major role in this kind of events. At the same time, you, can, you can't also safely assume that remote participants will just be lurkers. So they will just be sitting on a couch and watch a presentation without actually interacting. So most of the times you cannot just assume that a virtual event will be some sort of webinar on steroids. Active participation, however it will take form, it doesn't, doesn't have to be with microphones and stuff like this, but at any, at any rate, it, it needs to be much more important than before because you need that kind of interaction for a good event. And of course, I mean, uh, a broken remote speaker will indeed broke the, break the, the whole presentation. So it's important to make sure that testing takes place and that everything works fine in that regard. And again, as I was saying, interaction with remote speakers can, can take different forms and depending on the level of delay that you want to have. And so again, it doesn't need to be uh, via a microphone. We have active questions and so on, as long as you provide them with ways to interact, to make questions and something like this. And finally, of course, I mean, hallway conversations, social, social gatherings of any sort. I mean, this is one of the things I miss the most, but uh, there's little that can be done with respect to that. I'll try to address something quickly towards the end of the presentation, but the focus will mostly be on the uh, virtual events itself. And so, first of all, the, the first question that we may have would be, how do we schedule a virtual event? Mostly because with a live event, it's relatively easy. You know that you book the room for a number of days, you know that's where the presentations will take place, and so you schedule accordingly. Everybody will be fully busy in those rooms for a, for a series of hours and in a specific time zone that is really tied to, the, to where the location is. With virtual events, though, there is no actual site. So, for instance, I mentioned that the ITF was supposed to be in Madrid. It will not be, strictly speaking, Madrid the next time. And, of, and so, of course, there are some things that, they, that need to be taken into account. Since everybody is remote, it's easier to get uh, time zone clashes, so time zones that don't work for everybody. And at the same time, session slots may actually conflict with what you have to do on your daily job at the same time. It may be a bit more complex. And there are different school of thoughts on this. I mean, one approach may be to just use exactly the same on-site schedule that you have, but do it online, which is, for instance, the, the approach that the ATF has followed, the approach that ClueCon has followed as well which makes it feel closer to, let's say, to, the, to a live event. So you basically just allocate the same amount of time, the same amount of schedule, and of course has some drawbacks in terms of time zones because it's hard to find one that works for everybody. So it's a bit of a trade-off here. On the other end, you may want to, to do fewer talks per day and a longer event. So instead of doing 10 presentations in a day, you may can make three or four, and instead of having a three, four day event, you can make it last two weeks, for instance. And this has some advantages in terms of marketing advertisements and things like this, because of course a sponsor would be 
much more happy to be uh, to be prominent during the event for for a couple of weeks than for uh, for just a few days. On the other hand, if you spread the event too thin, you lose the focus of the event, and it it kind of misses the the kind of point that it's supposed to be an event rather than something that lasts too long. So again, a matter of trade offs. And finally, I mean, you can also do something that is much more dynamic. So you discuss with attendees, you find the time zones that work the most for the people that are interested in some, some sessions, and you organize the sessions accordingly, which has the drawback of being quite a nightmare in terms of scheduling itself, because session times may change. So it, it can be a bit more problematic, but again, it's, a, it's an option that may be worth exploring. Then, of course, once you've chosen that, you may wonder, should I go with a pre-recorded solution or should I go live instead? And again, there is no one size fits all uh, answer here. It really depends on, on the kind of event that you want to do and the kind of problem that you are trying to solve. In principle, you may think that a truly live event sounds like the obvious answer, mostly because, again, it can feel closer to an actual event, closer to, the, to, the, to an event schedule as it was originally planned. And besides, it allows for, a, let's say, a much more uh, real-time interaction with the audience also during presentations, which is, though, not always needed. So, for instance, it's very important for the ITF. It may not be as important for a regular event where you typically just have, for instance, a Q&A at the end, which means that sometimes it does make sense to actually go for a pre-recording approach instead, which does give you much more control on the end result as well. And so, incidentally, this is the approach that uh, Dan went with ComCon as well, uh, most importantly, because it was really interested in having a higher quality output as well that would match the standards of the previous ComCon talks. So it really did make sense for him to go through that road, mostly because you, you do give speakers some more time to, to make their presentations, make more takes, and I'm not going to tell you how many takes this, this took, you'll have to guess. And besides, the live interaction is still possible even uh, even in this case because you do not again you do not really need to have an interaction during the talk. You can do that after the talk in a live Q and A session, for instance. At the end of the day, what really matters is that no matter the approach you choose, eventually you will probably use WebRTC for the for the for the upload for the upload part. Which brings us to Janus. I mean, as I was mentioning, I'm the main author of Janus, an open source WebRTC server, which we conceived as general purpose. You can find here some some more links on uh, to the to the to the open source repo, some demos and documentation, and the active community that we have. I will not focus much on Janus itself. I will just hopefully give for granted that uh, that you guys know what it is. You can just assume it is a WebRTC server that gives you some flexibility in what you want to do. And I will not focus much on the uh, strictly speaking scalability aspects of Janus as well, mostly because I actually address these in another presentation I made for, for the first edition of ComCon a couple of years ago. And so I refer to that if you want to learn something, something more about it. I will instead focus more on, let's say, the kind of issues that, that are more relevant for a virtual event platform and how we, uh, we think we solve them for, for our own needs. And so first of all, when it comes to broadcasting the event, so let's say you, are, uh, you, you do have your input, and you now want to broadcast it. Will you go with WebRTC streaming? Will you go with a CDN like HLS or something like this? And once more, there is no simple answer because it really depends on what you want to do, or how, how important latency is if you need live interaction during the event and something like this. If latency and live interaction are important, then by all means, you should use WebRTC. Anything else would give you too much of a delay. Otherwise, it may make sense to have a CDN worry about scalability instead. I mean, there are a couple of trade-offs here. WebRTC, WebRTC is much lighter in terms of the, how, it relay, how it handles media because it just relays uh, packets around. So it doesn't do any mixing or transcoding unless we're strictly needed. But again, the scaling part is then up to you. So it's up to you to, to make sure that you have enough servers to, to broadcast via WebRTC. With the CDN, you do need to have a single audio video to distribute. So if you have multiple inputs, like for instance, an audio, video, screen sharing, multiple people talking to each other, you need to mix them together in real time, which does need some resources. But once you have that, you can pass this stream to a CDN and then it's not your problem anymore. I mean, CDNs have their own ways of dealing with scalability, scaling to a very, very wide audience. So assuming you're happy with the costs that, that may uh, take you, then it's definitely an option worth, worth considering, especially so if you're doing the pre-recorded uh, part, of course. Which brings us to an additional point. So can SFUs and MCUs actually be friends? And 
so if you're not very familiar with the terms, uh, SFUs are basically ways to relay uh, WebRTC media without doing any transcoding. So any stream that comes in goes out to the any, any interested participants just as they came in. So it's much easier on the CPU. Of course, it has much less delay as well because any packet coming in goes out uh, right away. Of course, you do need more bandwidth if you have multiple streams to distribute. So again, it's a matter of trade-off. And since you have different streams that you are distributing, you also have more control over the user interface aspect. I gave you some examples in the ITF uh, snippets before where I showed how I could basically allocate uh, the different videos however I wanted. And MCU, on the other end, does require some more CPU and does, does add some, some more delay. But at the same time, it just uh, distributes a single stream, which is, let's say, much more constant, or I should say consistent in terms of bandwidth. So it means that no matter how many participants there are, you are always going to say send the same amount of bytes uh, to participants, which can actually be a great advantage, especially if you, you don't want to abuse the, the bandwidth or if you have some devices that cannot sustain a huge amount of traffic anyway. You are a bit constrained in the URI, UI rendering part because the video layout is hard coded in the video stream. But again, it's all a matter of trade off. The important part I wanted to stress out is that you can actually have them both at the same time. So you may want to use an SFU approach for some things and an, M an MCU for others. So you may actually want to use them together. And a, a simple example may be I use an SFU approach for the conversation part and then I pass everything to an MCU to mix these all together in real time and broadcast it via SCDN. This is a, a very simple example, but already sh shows you the strengths that can, that can be done here. Which brings us to, uh, let's say, our efforts in that direction. And I'll show you a couple of examples that seem uh, unrelated and seem not strictly speaking related to virtual events, but actually uh, merge somehow, as I'll show later. And I'll start with a very simple example that are podcasts. So. Again, it's not strictly speaking a virtual event, but still a podcast is uh, a few people having a conversation, uh, one or two or three people interacting with each other, and then their conversation is broadcasted to a possibly very wide audience. And it is actually related to virtual events because in these troubled times, many podcast makers were actually doing all of their podcasts remotely. So they couldn't meet in a studio anymore. They really had to do everything remotely instead. And of course, if you think about it, WebRTC is a very good fit for the conversation part. And for instance, uh, Tim Panton himself is using WebRTC for his own distributed future podcast uh, platform. And mostly because it's really easy to have a chat just using your browser. It doesn't require anything else out of participants, guests, and so on. And besides, uh, with a bit of work, you can take advantage, you can implement broadcasting via WebRTC as well, which is uh, a nice plus. It may make sense to have the conversation mixed, though, for a few reasons. So first of all, uh, if you're broadcasting with WebRTC and you are not mixing, it means that the more participants you have, the more streams you have to relay to everybody. So it can be a bit more problematic in terms of negotiation, bandwidth, and so on. I mean, not unmanageable, but just a bit more problematic. Well, instead, if you're not broadcasting with WebRTC but taking advantage of a CDN, instead, you still need to mix anyway. So, and besides, it may uh, make sense when you want to have some more control of, on additional media. So, for instance, you may want to have a team at the beginning of the podcast. You may want to insert some clips, advertisement, and things like this. And so, which brings me to my next point. So, how do I optimize this potential mixing requirement with the ability to bring people in? in a scalable way. So if I want to broadcast these uh, as a mix, but I don't want people to be part of the mix, how do I bring them in when needed? So uh, in Janus, we do have a plugin that acts as an audio MCU, which is the audio bridge plugin, uh, which everything is mixed in this plugin, basically. And it has a nice feature that is called RTP forwarding, which basically means that I can extract in real time the, the current mix that is being generated in this conversation that you see and forward it via plain RTP to an external application, which can be another Janus instance, FNF, FMPEG, OG Streamer Pipeline, or these kind of things, which means that I can do something like this. So imagine I have a podcaster, I have a guest that they are talking to each other. I have them connected to the audio bridge MCU. They are having their conversation and they are talking some nice things. And then via RTP forwarding, we pass the mix to the streaming plugin. And then this becomes, again, a stream that we can broadcast exactly as we did for the, in the ATF scenario. So in this case, it means that without having to worry that any of those listeners that you see over there 
will weigh on the CPU for the mixing part. I will just distribute what I've already mixed instead. And of course, I'm not limited to take advantage of a single instance. So first of all, I could bring a participant in if I wanted. I can just mute his uh, incoming streaming uh, streaming feed. I can temporarily join him to the audio bridge, and then he will have he will be having the conversation with podcaster and guest. As soon as the listener is over, we can uh, we can remove him from the bridge, and then he can start listening to the uh, to the already mixed stream instead. And as I was saying you can actually distribute this uh, in a much more clever way. So instead of just relying on a single Janus instance, you can RTP forward to multiple Janus instances instead, which means that you widen your audience much more than, than, you would have, uh, than it would have been possible before. And at the same time, using a mix also gives you some, uh, some more advantages. So for instance, the ability of having multi-language streams, which may be interesting, for instance, in conferences where you have where you have the need for an interpreter. Let's say you have a, an audio, an English channel and a French channel. Uh, the main participants are discussing on the English channel. There is an interpreter connected to both. He listens to the conversation in English and speaks on the French channel to translate the conversation instead, which means that all French people can just connect to the French stream instead so that they are able to listen, it, listen to it in, in whatever language makes, uh, in a language that is more comfortable for them instead. So moving moving to video instead, we can uh, let's say start focusing on a on a probably more familiar scenario that is the so-called webinar. So typically, imagine a person making a presentation, pretty much as I'm doing right now. So uh, sharing his audio, sharing his video, sharing his screen, and a lot of passive viewers watching this presentation instead. Of course, this is a, a simplification because it can actually be more often than not quite conversational, like a podcast itself. So. A webinar may be a Q&A session, it may be an interview, or actually a panel, including multiple participants at the same time. The important part here is that WebRTC is definitely a good fit for the publishing part, because again, browsers do support screen sharing, so it's easy to do. They can capture a webcam and, and whatever. And besides, again, we could also leverage WebRTC for the broadcasting part as well, taking into account that we may not want to do any mixing here, and so it may require some more bandwidth and some more streams. Videos, though, may or may not be mixed, but if you want to mix them and then broadcast them via WebRTC, you still need to distribute them to a lot of participants, which brings me how you can do all that with Janus. So first of all, the, the plugin that we use in Janus for that is the Video Room plugin, which is the SFU plugin that we have in Janus. And in this case, you see, as an example, a participant sh sending his audio and video stream, which is then forwarded to the other participants in the room. Just as the audio bridge plugin, though, the video room plugin does support RTP forwarding, which means that we can relay the video coming from these participants to an external component as well, which means that, again, we can do something like this. A presenter sharing his, uh, his streams, we pass them to the streaming plugin, all the, all the listeners, uh, the viewers can then subscribe to the stream no matter what. And again, we can distribute these to more instances to for a more tree-based uh, distribution instead, which allows for a, let's say, much wider audience anytime that we need it to. And an important aspect to highlight is that if you want to make this more conversational, we can basically just replicate exactly the same distribution that you are making here uh, for the second participant as well. Be because basically we can just treat each presenter contributing something as a separate broadcast that we are injecting into the platform, which means that in this case, we could even use two completely different Janus instances to, to receive the stream from the two different speakers, as long as they then feed all the uh, distribution points that we have available. In this case, these four uh, streaming uh, endpoints uh, instances that we have, which allow us to basically reach a much wider audience that we would be able to serve with a single Janus instance itself. And it's basically these two uh, separate concepts are basically exactly what we borrowed from for our own uh, virtual events platform. So, in, and indeed, we, we decided to stick to mixing for audio streams and use an SFU mode for the video streams instead. Uh, unlike before, we are not using SIP anymore. So we are not using Asterisk either for the audio MCU. We, we are just using our own audio bridge for the job. And we are basically just reusing the podcast scenario that I was introducing before. So you have active participants connected to the bridge, and then everything, everybody else is connected to the streaming plugin instead, thanks to the RTP forwarding. For, for the video room, we use the SFU instead, as we, we described, using that uh, scalable approach that I was introducing, where you basically have different broadcasts being treated as if they are the same 
the same session, let's say. And of course, all of this is made completely transparent to users. I mean, users do not need to know that anything of, uh, like this is happening. They just see streams coming in and out. They just talk to an orchestrator and the fact that they may be talking to different Jano synthesis is completely hidden to them. And we do use Docker a lot. I mean, uh, I'm, I will not go much into details about this, uh, in this in this talk, but we do use Docker a lot for, for, all, this, uh, for all the scalability aspects. And just from a media perspective, again, this is not strictly speaking the virtual event platform, it's just the, how the media topology looks like. This is how the virtual event platform basically looks like. So you have the active participants all connected to the same audio bridge, and so they are all mixed in the same stream that we can then broadcast via multiple streaming instances. And at the same time, all the active participants that are also showing their video, because they may decide to either show it or not show it, even if they are actually talking via audio, then we distribute them using uh, the video room approach instead. I should clarify that in the current stage of the platform, actually the Janus number one and two you see in these slides are actually the same server. So we are still currently using the same video room instance for all the active participants, but that will actually be quite easy to update in the future. And it's actually one of the steps that we plan to, to, take, to take care of next. And this uh, kind of architecture is exactly what we've worked on to address the, the upcoming ITF 108 in Madrid. And this, this is basically already ready. We are now in the phase of testing it, ironing out some, some final bugs and doing some additional testing. And this is how it will look like. So let, let's say not very different from the platform that we had before, but a bit more functional and more tailored for, for remote participants themselves. And in this case, I was talking, chatting with my colleagues a bit, anticipating the slides that, would, that I would present today. The chat that you see over there is the ITF Jabber Room, because of course we do need to have the, that integrated as well. And again, we have freedom in how we want to distribute all these streams. We may want to hide the chat and focus more on the slides. We may want to focus more on a specific participant instead, in this case me, because I'm vain. Then we may want to hide slides entirely and just focus on the conversation instead. And then, of course, we do want to, to integrate other things that the ITF meetings do need. So, for instance, they recently switched from Etherpad to CodeEMD, which we already integrated in our own platform. And, of course, since uh, there is no live event taking place anymore and everything is remote, moderation becomes even more important. And in our session, Paolo, the guy that you see in the upper uh, right corner, was actually the moderator. So any attempt to, to get access to... To, to basically to be able to share our microphone and, and our webcam or our screen would go through him, which was, who was simulating what an actual ITF chair would, uh, would do. And he would basically choose who would be able to, uh, to basically contribute to the conversation in a dynamic way. And of course, this is what we plan to use uh, for our own event as well. So it will be very important for us to get this right so that when our the when Januscon comes, we will be able to, to provide a, a meaningful experience for remote attendees in that context too. And finally, I mean, just a couple of uh, minutes on hallway conversations. So as I was saying before, this is one of the things that, that I miss the most. So in this case, for instance, this is a picture from the last ComCon in the UK, which I really enjoyed. And I was having a nice conversation with a few attendees there. And this is uh, quite hard to, to do right in a virtual event platform, mostly because the challenges are, are very different. So uh, whether it's just chats like these, all way conversations or social gatherings, dinners and so on, they are always very important and they constitute an important part of all events because it's, again, it's not really just work. You don't just go there to watch a presentation and learn something new. You always you also go there to to talk about to talk with interesting people about interesting stuff. Know more people, do some networking, and these kind of things, which is indeed harder to translate to the virtual world, especially when you think of an event that has thousands of attendees. So, first of all, there is no scheduling involved. This is just hallway conversations, things that can happen at any time. People that you bump into and start having a chat with. So much more dynamic. And it's also harder to give the right human feel and contact in this case, because there, there really isn't any, we're just talking to a screen somehow. And besides the sheer number of interactions, so if you have thousands of attendees and you want them to mingle somehow, can have a huge impact on the scalability of the platform instead. So, and you definitely don't want that to steal resources from the, the virtual event itself, which still needs to maintain its relevance. 
And there are a few different ways to handle this. This is something that we haven't tackled yet, but we are starting to brainstorming things a bit. So one way to do that could be several, let's say, smallish peer-to-peer -peer conversations, which, let's say, uh, you allow three or four people at every time to have uh, to talk to each other without impacting your infrastructure too much, if not for the signaling part. You may want to involve some SFU for larger ones. So, for instance, two smallish conversations that merge together because they are talking about the same things or they all know each other. An interesting innovation may be some sort of an explorable space, like a video game of some sort where you have avatars, you walk around in this virtual space, and then you can trigger conversations with people that way. Trigger conversations that may happen via WebRTC again. Or you may want to uh, take advantage of even more advanced and innovative stuff. So for instance, like a VR environment where you have all participants interact, taking advantage of platforms like Hubs or VR Landio or, or things like this. Again, uh, there are different ways to handle these. Probably anyone is as good as the other, but I, I definitely see uh, interesting things happening in that space. And so something that we want to invest on later, later on. And this basically covers my, my presentation. So uh, I hope that this was informative enough. I tried to, to cover a bit the, uh, let's say, how it all started, how, how we were doing, doing things before, and how we moved to, to the platform that we have right now. And I hope that, uh, that it was interesting enough for you. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to address them in, uh, in the QA sessions later on. Thanks. Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, just hearing the, um, the, the kind of the same steps that I've been through with ComCom virtual and how to, how to take that from a virtual, from a, from a country house in the UK, um, over the course of two or three days to, to ComCom virtual and, and doing things maybe a little bit differently to, to a lot of other conferences that have just kind of taken their schedule and shoved it online. Um, and as, as you said, that, that, that doesn't always work because of time zones. Um, and, and especially in our industry, um, we are spread out across the world. Um, and, and so trying to find a, a time zone that works for everyone is, is impossible. So, um, no, that was really, really interesting. Um, so everyone, if you want to take part in Q and a, um, that's going to take part, uh, that's going to happen on, on riot. Um, the, the, the link for Riot will be in the description of this video. Um, it's riot.comcon.xyz. Um, go sign up for an account and you'll get shoved into a general and announcements room. And then we'll sort out a QA and a um, in there. Um, and there will, there will also be opportunity to speak to sponsors, um, speak to speakers um, over, over video um, and ask questions and get them answered on a one-to-one -one basis, um, which is pretty cool. Um, something that we don't, like at the end of a session, normally we get ushered out of the room to have our conversation in the hallway. Um, so, so now we can do it at the comfort of our own desks. Um, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, yeah, and hope, and hopefully I'll, I'll be wearing a different t-shirt at the, <laughs> for the Q&A. <laughs> well, <that laughs> Otherwise was, people thing. will find out but, that I'm kind of a shut-in. <laughs> Con continuity, uh, it's a, it's a huge issue, exactly. um, but, uh, thank you everyone for watching. Um, and we'll be back later on today, um, for another session. Don't go anywhere qu quite yet though. We've got to say thank you to all of our sponsors with, without them, none of this would have even happened in the first place. So for our platinum sponsors, we've got Tulu, Voxphone and Ciara. For our gold sponsors, we've got the Matrix Foundation, Vonage, Sangoma, Telviva, and Lowe. Our silver sponsors are Aptose, Pion, Telco Bridges with Pro SBC, Avoxy, 8x8 with Jitsi, and Firstcom Europe. And we've also got community sponsors, QXIP and Cycle Systems. Without any of them, this would never have even happened. You wouldn't have had all of this free content on YouTube. So go say thank you to all of them. Go look at what they provide, what services they offer, um, and have a, have a conversation with them all um, over on Riot, riot.comcon.xyz. The link will be in the description below, along with links to all of our sponsors. You can go and watch um, preview videos from all of our gold sponsors right now over on YouTube. The links will be 
somewhere over here. Um, all I've got to say is thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, and I'll see you over on the Q&A shortly. Cheers.